Welcome back. For our next session, we are featuring Ethan Mollick. Ethan is a professor at Wharton studying tech innovation and startups. He's also the author of the wonderful newsletter called One Useful Thing. I'm constantly amazed by it. It reassures at the same time that it excites, at the same time that it makes it clear to all of us that there's no choice but to move forward with AI. His next book, tentatively titled Alien Minds, will offer rules to navigate and leverage generative AI tools, predicting who will win and lose as a result of the AI revolution. Over to you, Ethan. Hi, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about AI. We're just going to be able to scratch the surface in the 15 or so minutes that we have together. But uh, even though that was a great intro, I wanted to start with an additional introduction. Hello, I'm a professor at Wharton. I start Wharton School. I erforsche KI, Innovation, Unternehmertum und Bildung auf verschiedene Weisen. And of, of course, I don't actually speak German at all. That was virtual me, um, animated by AI, with my voice animated by AI. And I think a side note about AI that's not going to be core to what we're talking about, but is still very important, is the realization that the cat's sort of out of the bag. You shouldn't believe anything you see online anymore. In fact, in this entire presentation, there's going to be one real image. So part of your job here is if you get bored by other things I'm saying, look for the one real picture and uh, see if you can find it. Neither of these are real. Everything else was created by me, by the way. I didn't like hire someone, find anything online. This is stuff that just took me a couple of minutes to make. Uh, both of these are, of course, fake as well. But I want to start with just giving you three principles for AI. Um, so first off, AI is completely undetectable. Um, if you squint, you should be able to see AI everywhere in these pictures, but we can't tell what AI writing is uh, or what AI writing isn't at this point. Um, there is no detector out there. That's part of why schools are in a panic. There is no way to figure out what is written by AI and what isn't. The second is ubiquitous, uh, which I also was hoping to get through with these images. So the very best AI model in the world is GPT-4. That's going to change in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, with the release of Google's Gemini, but then we'll probably switch back to OpenAI later, more on that. Um, but in any case, uh, it's everywhere. So there is no place where you're not going to find it. And this very best model, GPT-4, is available for free to everybody on the planet as a result of Microsoft's Bing. So no matter who you are, you could be Goldman Sachs or you could be a teenager in Uganda, you have access to the same AI model. And finally, transformative. Uh, you probably have heard of ChatGPT. Well, GPT also stands for general purpose technology. And general purpose technology is any technology that broadly touches all of society. They're very rare. Maybe their last one was the internet and computers, but that took 50 years. Then before that, we were talking about steam. And before that, we were probably talking about um, you know, uh, electricity, steam, things like that. So this is, this is a, a broadly applicable technology that will broadly touch every part of culture and society in different ways at different speeds. So let's dive into a little bit about AI because AI has been a topic we've talked about a lot. And if you've heard about AI before now, you've probably heard about it in terms of thinking about things like the Terminator or sort of science fiction novels, or maybe you've heard about how AI affects things like allows us to do large scale predictions. So how Amazon organizes its warehouses is by uh, using AI systems to figure out what people might order next and where to place demand and things like that. Uh, Tesla figures out where to drive a car as a result of um, the uh, data coming in from a sensor. So this kind of AI system has been around for a while. It's about prediction. It's about we have data and we use that data to make predictions about the future. That kind of information requires large amounts of data, requires uh, PhD analysts. And if you've written a book or read a book about AI before 2022, you almost certainly were talking about this form of AI, which was all about algorithmic data prediction. The thing is, is that this kind of AI was actually very bad at crafting human language, something probably interesting to the audience here, um, because it didn't really have context. So if a sentence ended with the word filed, these AIs didn't know whether that meant filed your taxes or filed your nails. In 2017, if you weren't in, in, uh, in um, computer science, you probably didn't recognize this, but this paper came out called Attention is All You Need. Um, and Attention is All You Need set up this idea of attention mechanisms, uh, outlined this idea called the transformer, which is what underlines modern large language models, the ability of AI to produce language. And the transformer mechanism allows AI to look at the entire context of a sentence or paragraph or book and be able to tell what part of that to pay attention to. So this allowed AI to start to be able to predict next words in language. So when we talk about AI now, and the context of this conversation we're having today, we're talking about these ideas of large language models that can actually predict the next word, not in sentences, but actually be able to predict a lot of text. And um, they're powered by use. These models are pre-trained. That's the P in GPT. They are actually know a lot of information about the world already. So they don't need data. Anyone in the world can use these and get results from them. 
So how do these systems work? Well, broadly, these large language models are trained on all the data everywhere. Uh, that means web searches, that means Wikipedia, but it also means a lot of books of dubious origin. Um, so I actually was able to get my hands on one of the archives that these L, uh, that a lot of the LMs were trained on called the Books One Archive. And it's almost all self-published romance novels, though I'm sure there's some copyright material in there, which is something I know that is of concern to people in the room. But it's taken all of this low-quality data and over the course of millions of dollars uh, and many months of training, the AIs learn the connections between words or parts of words called tokens. So it knows that avocado and turnip are related, camel and deer are related, but grape and dolphin are not related. But this is just a two-dimensional representation of what's actually a multi-dimensional, very complex space. So the AIs learn all of these relationships between words and parts of words over time. And as a result, it can make predictions about the next word in a sentence. So you could say the best thing about AI is the ability to do what? To do blank, to learn, to predict, to make, to understand. That's how AI works. Basically, it's predicting the next word or token in a set. It's like a fancy autocomplete. It turns out that's not very helpful to know because at some sort of scale that AIs have reached, they've actually seemed to have figured out the hidden sequence of human language. And as a result, they could do things that their creators didn't expect. I talked to OpenAI, Microsoft, people like Google all the time, and nobody really expected ChatGPT to be as powerful as it was. So sorry, November, things got weird. These are the exam score results of ChatGPT on various kinds of exams. Uh, so you can see that this is not the percent right, by the way. This is the percent of human test takers beaten by the AI. So so it beats 65% um, of people on the GRE qualitative exam. It beats, uh, you know, on the AP psychology exam, 85%. And that's the free version of chat. When GPT-4 came out, it pushed things even further. It's essentially beating humans at the bar exam, the uh, SATs, the AP exams, and not just that. When we test this on uh, the graph on the left came from a paper comparing the results of GPT-4 compared to Stanford medical students, second and third year medical students, evaluating medical conditions. It beats them. On the right-hand side, that's a report card from Harvard uh, where uh, professors were asked to grade across various fields um, the quality of, of AI's work. Um, and it got a 3.34, which is pretty good, uh, even with Harvard grade inflation. And then it starts to be even crazier. So we actually completed a study at BCG, the elite consulting company, where we gave some of the consultants access to AI and some not in a controlled experiment. And we found that it actually improved the quality of the work by the consultants by 40%. They got their work done 20% faster and they got more work done. And another really interesting feature of this is it actually seems to level different performance differences. So for the bottom half of participants, when they used AI, the quality of their work was judged higher than the top participants in, in, at BCG. Uh, the top people got a little bit of a boost, but not as much. And it's not just about sort of this kind of production work. It's also about innovation. So my colleagues have a paper showing that uh, when you they took the uh, this is Carl Ulrich and Christian Turwich. Carl Ulrich literally wrote the textbook on product development, and he found that the AI actually was more creative than our Wharton people. Don't laugh; they actually are pretty creative uh, at uh, the uh, at, in uh, idea generation. So, of the forty best ideas generated out of a class, including judged by willingness to pay by other humans, uh, I think thirty six of those came from the AI. And so the result is a really broad-based change to how we're going to approach work in society that um, is a pretty big deal. So um, this is another paper showing you that the relationship between AI and uh, jobs is actually kind of different than other waves of autom automation we've seen. So um, in AI, uh, the effect of AI and jobs, it shows you the overlap between generative AI and work. And there's almost a perfect connection between how creative your job is, how highly paid your job is, and how educated your job is, and the effect of AI in your work. So the overlap, which doesn't mean replacement, but does mean interaction, is highest for the people I'm talking to here, for many of the people who are readers. Like those are the people most affected by AI. Ethan, given all that you've discovered about generative AI, what do you think the broad implications are for the book publishing industry? I, I think because generative AI is so wide applicable, it's going to have lots of effects. So the obvious things are office work, marketing work. I think I showed you some examples about why that might be a big deal. The BCG study showing that there's increased productivity and performance, that's for analysis work, creative work, persuasion work, the kinds of work we all do all the time. So I think there's a broad performance implication that's going to happen. I think that there's also some very big questions about how writing and reading changes. So you could put, I have put my entire previous book into Claude, which is uh, has a 
large enough context window to hold an entire book. And it can identify the metaphors in the book. It can do readings from different perspectives. I can tell it to be different people and it will read my book differently. And there's actually some work showing that from a marketing perspective, if you tell it to act like somebody, it will actually give you actual willingness to pay from that person's perspective. So I think that they're really broad-based implications. And I think the only way to know is to start using it. And the great thing about AI is nobody knows anything right now. There's no instruction manual. So the good thing is whatever you're best at, at in publishing, if you dive into AI, there's a good chance you will find a way to use it that nobody else knows. I want to talk really quickly about just a few implications of AI for different areas. Uh, for work, uh, I gave myself a challenge, actually. I do a lot of product launches. How much work can AI do in 30 minutes? So I set myself a time limit, 30 minutes, end to end, start a timer. How much work could I get done? Um, so I actually worked with me and launched a product I developed at Wharton, which is a game that teaches leadership skills called the Saturn Parable. So started the timer, asked AI, you have 30 minutes. Um, and let's, let's start working together. So um, first look up information about my game. Great, it learns about it. Then create a full email marketing campaign. Creates a complete email marketing campaign, four different emails. It could have sent the emails too. I didn't let it do that. But the emails did things like indicate scarcity and did a case study, really nice emails. Again, we do product marketing all the time. This was a pretty exciting change. Uh, then we went from there to um, coming up with a website strategy. It came with a full website strategy for me during that period of time. And then I asked it to actually build the website. It built a full HTML page, CSS files, images, told me what images to create, all of that downloadable. Uh, then create a social campaign, and it actually created a social campaign, including little talking heads here. Imagine you are a leader on a mission to Saturn. And also full social campaigns for four different social media sites. Then my timer ran out. So in 30 minutes, I was able to do 9,200 words of emails and plans, 12 images, a website, uh, a, a voice file. I only had to give 20 commands, and we fired a marketing company because there was no reason to use them anymore. Because the time we had one meeting with them, we could do all this work. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here and discuss a couple of other things. First off, our research is showing that um, you need to think about work in terms of a human, what tasks you want to do that are human only, what tasks you want to delegate to AI, and then what tasks are we call cyborg or center tasks. So a cyborg task is a task you're deeply integrated with AI. A centaur task is like the half person, half horse, where you're separating your work from AI. So you're like, I'm good at doing um, emails or marketing, but the AI is better at data analysis. So we're going to alternate between who's doing the work. And so tightly integrating work really matters. And the only way to learn how to use AI is to use it a lot. Um, one of the things we discovered in our research was we call the jagged frontier of AI capabilities. AI is really good at some things you would expect it to be bad at and is really bad at things you might expect to be good at. So for example, it can write a darn good um, Sestina um, or Sonnet but it can't write a 50 par word paragraph. That's because the AI doesn't see paragraphs the way we do. It doesn't see sentences the way we do. Um, so it makes it uh, confusing sometimes to operate in this kind of way. We call this the jagged frontier. And unless you use AI enough, you won't know the difference between tasks AI is good at and tasks AI is bad at. And we found that when people are given tasks to use that are outside the frontier of AI and they don't realize about this jagged frontier, they actually perform worse because they get fooled by what AI can do and what AI can't do. So I wanna talk about a couple other things really quickly. One of those is the changes that are happening in education. This is literally the education assignment in, uh, assignment in my class now uh, for my entrepreneurship class. People have to do one impossible thing. So they have to actually now go ahead and um, if they didn't, uh, they if they couldn't code, they would need working software. They could do graphic design. I expect fully working graphic design and, and outcomes. Uh, and they have to have three famous entrepreneurs critique everything they do in my class. So as a result, the class has gone from doing theoretical stuff before, like creating a prototype of product design, to actually doing real products at the end. So they actually do real stuff. And the AI does all sorts of other stuff, creates interactive applications with a click. Um, and there's so much more we could talk about here. I, I know that I'm running out of time. So I want to end with one last kind of note for all of you here. This is the worst AI you're ever going to use. So you're going to have to think about what the future looks like. And I think people who don't use AI or are worried about it tend to think about AI as a static thing that's not going to change. That's not happening. I can guarantee you for at least the next year, we're going to see change, at least the next two years probably. And then a lot of people are worrying about what's called AGI, the idea that AI may become smarter than humans at some point. I think that's something for us to worry about. But I think that it is 
somewhat of a distraction. Like it's apocalyptic. So I'm glad governments and people are concerned about this. But I think the more likely scenario for all of us with jobs, with work, with in publishing is to think about the idea that change is going to keep happening. And the question is, is it going to be linear change? Is it going to go from the 80th percentile of work to 81st, 82nd? Or is it going to come up next year to the 90th percentile of work and then the 99th percentile of the year after? We don't know the answer. But the point is, is that AI does stuff we wouldn't expect. Like it's good at creative work. I actually asked um, Midjourney to generate a bunch of images of um, various uh, photo shoots in the style of various artists. So these are 100% AI generated images of Van Gogh and uh, Basquiat and Klimt and Monet and Dolly inspired fashion. And it looks good. Like these are interesting pictures. And of course, that also means the information environment is going to be confusing. I asked the AI to generate pictures for you of the um, Hello Kitty invasion. Uh, and this is what we got, uh, cell phone photos. So don't trust anything you see. I'm going to ask you really quickly, what was the one real image of this entire presentation? And here's a hint. It was one of the two of my class. I'll give you a second to guess. It was the one on the left is the real image. So almost nobody gets this right. That ship has sailed. We will never know what's real again. So last couple thoughts for you here. Invite AI to everything you do. The only way to know what this does is to use it for everything you ethically and legally can to find out its limits. Second, be the human in the loop. Recognize what you bring as a human to the table and what you want to maintain human control over. Start using AI. The easiest way to use it, even though it's a sin to treat it like a person because computer scientists don't like us to anthropomorphize AI, it's the best way to work with it. Use it like a person and tell it what kind of person it is and recognize this is the worst AI you're ever going to use. So it's only going to get weirder from here. So um, final thoughts. We have infinite cognition available to billions of people. What's that going to do to everything we work on, everything we do? It's an important question. And then finally, um, thank you. There's so much more we could talk about. I have a whole bunch of guides on um, oneusefulthing.org, as you said, and uh, look forward to talking more with many of you in the coming months uh, as things continue to change and evolve. So thank you for having me. That's great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.